Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14431 in the name of Mark Macdonald on welcoming the Healthy Start, Healthy Scotland campaign. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Further invite members who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly and I call on Mr Macdonald to open the debate. Mr Macdonald, you have seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by expressing my gratitude to members across the Chamber who supported my motion and enabled us to have this important debate today. Um, the Healthy Start Healthy Scotland campaign was launched at the cross-party group on mental health in this Parliament, which I co-convene alongside Mary Scanlon uh, and Malcolm Chisholm. And at that meeting, I said I would seek the opportunity to debate uh, the issue in the Chamber uh, so here we are. Uh, never let it be said that I am not a man of my word. Uh, the campaign is aimed at improving awareness among professionals and the public regarding maternal mental illness. Uh, it is also aimed at reducing the stigma surrounding mental health problems for mothers and increasing professionals' confidence in detecting and treating it. Uh, to that end, there will the uh, Royal College of Psychiatry in Scotland aim to hold public events with professionals, politicians and the media in order to drive that forward. They also also uh, are aiming to have practitioners working with mothers and children being aware of the issues related to maternal mental health problems uh, and to work holistically to address them. And they will be seeking to establish an interfaculty group, links to other royal colleges and hosting a round table bringing together parents and children's representatives, voluntary agencies, statutory early years agencies and professional organisations to ensure that best practice can be shared across Scotland. Uh, one in five women, presiding officer, will develop a mental illness during pregnancy or in the first postnatal year. Uh, but beyond that, seven in ten women will either hide or underplay the severity of their illness. One in two women who experience depression in the perinatal period will go undiagnosed. So while one in five will develop, only one in two will be, uh, will be diagnosed. And while postpartum depression is the most commonly used term, maternal mental health problems can also include anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorders, and postpartum psychosis. And it's important to note, presiding officer, that we often talk about the baby blues, but these are uh, considered separate from postpartum depression. Uh, the baby blues are, are a feeling that affect around 70% of new mothers, a feeling of despondency that occurs after the birth of a baby. And often the two terms are conflated, which I think sometimes uh, can, can be unhelpful. We know that inequality is correlated with poor maternal mental health. And while postnatal depression can occur for, for, for any mother, regardless of income, we do know uh, from uh, the Scottish Government's own figures that 6% uh, of the highest income mothers were found to have poor mental health compared to 24% of the lowest income mothers. The Scottish Government's Growing Up, Scotland, uh, report, Growing Up in Scotland reports have shown that children whose mothers were emotionally well during their first four years developed better, social, emotional, uh, better socially, emotionally and behaviourally than those whose mothers had brief mental health problems. So as well as this being an issue for the mother themselves, there is also an impact on the children which has to be borne in mind when we are looking at these issues. Um, around 5% of children aged 5 to 10 are thought to display problems which merit mental health diagnosis. That, I think, is something which is of concern to all of us, uh, but it is something uh, for which treatment uh, is available both for the mothers and also for the children. And what we need to ensure is that, firstly, we ensure that people are coming forward for diagnosis, and then once they've achieved diagnosis, the treatment, the most appropriate treatment, is available. Now, uh, there is work being done across Scotland uh, in terms of not just treatment, but also uh, working with families. And I want to highlight uh, a project being uh, undertaken uh, in Aberdeen, which I think uh, merits being brought to the Chamber. I think one of the, the duties upon us as MSPs is to highlight positive examples from our own areas. Uh, four projects... Uh, 
have come together to form uh, a family support network, the Family Learning, uh, Aberlour, uh, Community Childminding uh, and Home Start Aberdeen. This integrated working strategy has reduced duplication of services, but also ensures that the third sector is working closely with NHS midwives and health visitors to ensure appropriate referrals and support can be targeted. Home Start uh, have supported a total of 115 families since the 1st of April this year. They work closely with health visiting teams. 80% uh, of their referrals come from health visitors. They provide support from peers who are mostly parents themselves, uh, who are matched with an individual family that they then visit on a weekly basis. Uh, over 80% of their uh, referrals in Aberdeen uh, arise as a result of or uh, have a mental health issue involved and over 90% are related to isolation. Isolation has an impact on mental health and also on the child who does not have the opportunity to socialise with their peer group. Uh, the Aberlour service uh, supports parents affected by substance uh, abuse issues and also parents with learning disabilities uh, and referrals are made through social work. The Scottish Childminding Association uh, provides community childminding service and in Aberdeen that allows parents to access up to 72 hours of free childminding to support them, uh, which uh, I think is an invaluable service for many families. And the family learning team can provide one-to-one -one in the home support for parents with children aged 0 to 3 or provide support programmes in small groups for parents with children aged 3 to 8. So there is fantastic work being done out there, presiding officer. And one of the things which led me to bring this debate to the Chamber today, presiding officer, was that I, I wanted to reflect my own experience because following uh, the birth of our second child, my wife went through a period of postnatal depression and I saw firsthand the effect that that has, not just on the individual themselves, but on the family unit uh, as well. Uh, one of the difficulties that was caused, and which I referenced through the Home Start example, was that difficulty of isolation. My wife became very isolated. She lost, lost the confidence to be able to go out and interact with other family groups, and therefore to, to get my daughter into situations where she would be meeting with other small children. And two things helped uh, in that. Uh, one was uh, a local coffee morning in my area which my wife attended on a regular basis and which enabled her to interact with others outside of the home environment because when my son was uh, at education and when I was down here in Parliament uh, my wife found it difficult to get out of the house. The other was a local toddlers group which we were able to uh, take my daughter along to which enabled her to develop uh, social interactions uh, and also to meet with peer groups as well. And that's why I was really taken by the remarks by Sam H recently in the press around the benefits and the possibilities of social prescribing, which I think is something which would be particularly relevant to issues around maternal mental health issues, where isolation and an inability to socialise and a feeling that, that, that they cannot reach out perhaps to other mothers uh, for fear of stigmatisation can often grip people who find themselves affected by maternal mental health issues. So I think that the, there is good work out there. There are good examples to be drawn from. Uh, it's a question now of making sure the dots are joined together and also that we in this chamber do all that we can to support our constituents who are affected by these issues and make sure that they get the support that they deserve. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Jenny Mara to be followed by David Torrance. Presiding officer, I would like to congratulate Mark Macdonald for securing this important debate, uh, bringing focus on this important area of mental health, but also sharing uh, so eloquently his own personal experience, which is, is never easy uh, to do. Um, presiding officer, every expert, every report, every piece of advice we are given about tackling child poverty and other social injustices tell us that we should be investing in the early years. What the Healthy Start, Healthy Scotland report has done is remind us of the importance of the early months, the early weeks, and the early days. We know much more today than we did in the past about postpartum depression and anxiety and the challenges that women face in that first year as a mother, often um, feeling quite alone. And despite this, it is clear we still face a significant challenge in ensuring that women have the support and care they need. The symptoms are noticed and there is an awareness of these issues. Presiding officer, it is estimated that one in two women who experience depression in pregnancy and in the postnatal period 
will go undetected and untreated. But we are only now discovering the full impact that mental health problems in this crucial time have on the children. The relationship between the mother and baby and those early bonds are vital to the optimal development of the child's brain and can shape social, emotional, cognitive and language development. And because of the nature of these problems, it can be all too common to miss the signs and not get the care in place to help both mother and baby. So providing that awareness and support of maternal health is vital to giving all children the best start in life. Presiding officer, we welcome this significant report by the Royal College of Psychiatrists and the broad support it has received across Parliament. It is a modest set of proposals which could make a big difference to the lives of many women, uh, many children and many families. And I'm sure there is broad consensus across the Chamber for the actions suggested in this report. I look forward to hearing more contributions uh, in the debate and also from government benches on what can be done. And we are ready to work with them to achieve these shared goals. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, I now call on David Torrance to be followed by Mary Scanlon. Thank you, President Officer. I would also like to congratulate Mark MacDonald on bringing this motion to Parliament today. Let me start by commending the Royal College of Psychiatrists for its effort to raise the issue of mental health among new and expectant mothers through its Healthy Start, Healthy Scotland campaign. Mental health is a complex, but I believe these issues can be mitigated with the proper awareness and advocacy that College seeks to foster. I would like to focus in particular on the problems surrounding both the diagnosis and the treatment of mental health issues affecting new mothers. Starting with the diagnosis of these issues, the Royal College of Psychiatrists reports one in two women who experience depression in pregnancy or postnatal period will go undetected and untreated. The NHS reports that postnatal depression is one of the most common mental health issues affecting new mothers. Symptoms include an inability to sleep, irritation, tearfulness and fearful of failing as a mother. However, as one of the main challenges surrounding postnatal depression, it is that these symptoms are not always noticeable to the observer or even to the mother herself. Women affected by illness can often perceive these symptoms to be a product of exhaustion and stress. Because they do not connect with the symptoms to postnatal de depression, some women do not seek help, and as a result, issues for new mothers persist much longer than necessary. According to the Royal College of Psychiatrists, some women also fear the judgment of others. They are worried about stigma surrounding mental health, as well as being un deemed unfit mothers. This is why raising awareness of the pre- and postnatal post -natal mental health is so essential. We can show mothers the help is available to reduce social stigmas. These problems surrounding diagnosis connect to my second point, the treatment of mental health for mothers. I'm proud to say that there are several organisations in my constituency that address the issue and support new mothers. Volunteers from Home Start Kirkcaldy provide weekly support to any family in need, include mothers suffering from postnatal mental illness. Our local branch of Carers Trust provides further counselling and support. And Five Gingerbread provides not only support after the birth of a child, but also provides counselling during pregnancy to try to prevent mental health issues once a child is born. These services are invaluable to those who use them. I was concerned, however, to learn that primary support groups for postnatal men mental illness have a larger presence in England than in Scotland. For exa example, the Pandas Foundation, which runs support groups for mothers coping with postnatal mental illness, sponsors 31 groups in England and only five in Scotland. This fact makes it clear to me that there is a greater need for awareness, advocacy and action on the issue in Scotland. I have no doubt about the dedication of the staff and volunteers of these organisations in Scotland and that in the work they do, they will continue to highlight the important issue and seek to develop their services even further. However, I feel that it is essential that community support be aligned with medical treatment. Mental health requires professional care and treatment that can only be given by a physician. In fact, the RCP reports that 25% of mothers who suffer from postnatal mental illness and do not seek help do not recover by the time their child is one year old. This is pl places a great deal of strain on the relationship between the mother and child and can ultimately affect the child's development. 
Early intervention and treatment facilitate recovery for a mother and a healthy start to a life of a child. Additionally, it is crucial to involve physicians, mothers and family members in the treatment. In talking about the importance of early intervention, I'd like to draw to attention one of the Royal College of Psychiatrists' action items regarding its Healthy Start, Healthy Scotland campaign. But it is a desire to establish links with other Royal Colleges in the UK by cooperating with organisations like the Royal College of Obstetricians and Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, the RCP can better ensure that new mothers and infants will receive the care they need. I believe that this is a move that will increase cohesion in antenatal and postnatal health care and benefit the mothers and children. President Officer, I fully support the Royal College of Psychiatrists' Healthy Start, Healthy Scotland campaign and its attention to mental health needs new and expecting mothers can face. I am pleased to see that the organisation is taking steps to provide essential care to help mothers, their families and their new babies. In conclusion, there is a clear message we should extend to all mothers. Postnatal illness are easily preventable and treatable. Only by achieving greater awareness for mental health, we can create a brighter, healthier future for Scotland. Thank you so much. Now call on Mary Scanlon to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you. I would also like to thank Mark Macdonald for securing this debate on improving the mental health of mothers and babies. Mark gave a commitment, as he said, at the cross-party group on mental health to raise the issue in a member's debate, and I say well done. And for my part, I committed to submitting parliamentary questions. And I very much regret to say that the responses to my questions were disappointing and a bit dismissive. And I can only hope that we do get a more favourable response to this cross-party debate today and something more positive. I also commend the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland for their initiative uh, and stating that much needs to be done to help support mothers and babies in terms of improving maternal early years mental health as a clinical and a mental health priority. The cost of not treating infant mental health is £8 billion in the Royal College paper. So any investment in diagnosis and support has to be money well spent. There's probably not much that's new in the briefing paper and research in terms of knowledge, but what is needed is the will to put the measures in place, get the health professionals and others to work together and ensure that mental health at this critical time in a child's development becomes a priority that it hasn't been in the past. And I think we can all understand it's very understandable that depressed mothers find it difficult to give their babies the security they need. There is also increasing evidence that social relationships in early life have a crucial influence on the infant brain, as Jenny Mara alluded to, and the relationships between infants' attachment and their brain anatomy and biochemistry is now very well established, with brain development dependent on strong early bonds with the infant's main caregiver, most often the mother, and the relationships an infant makes in early life forms the bedrock of their future development. We're currently facing legislation on attainment in schools. However, after this debate, we don't really need to wait until a child gets to school. Intervention at the antenatal and postnatal stages with the appropriate support for mother and child could bring so many benefits. We've all heard of some children who are 12 months behind in terms of their development when they start school, making it very difficult for them to catch up. And we know that it is in the first year of life that the interaction with the primary caregiver shapes the infant's social, emotional, cognitive and language development. But untreated mental health doesn't just have a financial cost. The longer term effects on the child's cognitive and emotional development can hugely affect their educational attainment, their life chances and their opportunities. So it's therefore surely preferable and effective to prioritise early work with infants and their mothers than even attempt to reverse harm at a later stage. As Mark Macdonald said, the Royal College paper also states that one in two women who experience depression in pregnancy or the postnatal period will go undetected and untreated. And for those where depression is detected, 
In so many cases, they are not offered the option of being accompanied by their babies if they require inpatient care. And this is quite unacceptable. They are supposed to have a right to be accompanied by their babies, but it's also unacceptable, as the Royal College paper states, that very few mental health services in Scotland specifically address the needs of infants and focus on the mother-infant relationship. I just wanted to say that I lost a very dear friend who struggled to cope with postnatal depression and left two very young boys. Sorry, it just brought it back to me today. Um, and that was difficult for her. She was a professional woman, worked in the NHS, had a staff of 20 or more staff, and she found it very difficult to admit because she was so good at her profession that she could have a vulnerability and she actually felt weak and she felt something of a failure. So uh, my apologies. Uh, the Royal College campaign to improve awareness is very welcome uh, uh, in this campaign. But the main thing is, it's not just the Royal College of Psychiatrists, it's the links with the ro other Royal Colleges in Scotland, such as the obstetricians and gynaecologists, the general practitioners, the midwives, as well as the paediatrics and child health. It's bringing them all together that is needed to better detect mental health and attachment and in order to look forward to the future. So all I can say is that there's, a, there's not a good record of public agencies working together for seamless assessment and care. But this one can be made to happen. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It simply brings people together and makes mother and baby mental health the priority that it should be. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now, I call on Bob Doris to be followed by Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I start as others have done and uh, congratulate Mark McDonald for securing this important debate here this afternoon? And I'm proud to join the Parliament in welcoming the Royal College of Psychiatrists Healthy Start Healthy Scotland campaign. Now, I'm Deputy Chair of the Health and Sport Committee, and it's something the Health and Sport Committee, uh, the health of mothers, have well focused on. Uh, maybe we should focus on it more often, but there are aspects we've looked at, whether it's the benefits of the family nurse partnership, whether it's their inquiry into unplanned teenage pregnancy and the mental health impact that, that mothers can, can have in relation to that, or whether it's looking at the early years collaborative. I know um, some groundbreaking work that local authorities and the Scottish Government are doing together. There's a lot of, lot of things happening. But it's particularly poignant for myself taking part in this afternoon's debate because uh, I have to be a I will be a father for the first time in February next year. My, my wife is due to give birth. So the idea of maternal mental health is something which uh, I hope will flourish um, and be positive for myself and my family. But as Mary Scanlon points out, you can never take anything in this life for granted. And we must, n none of us, whether it's mothers or otherwise, should neglect our own mental health. So a particular importance to myself in speaking this afternoon's uh, debate. Uh, this campaign is an important initiative to raise awareness of mental health problems that so many expectant and current mothers do face each year. And I was going to put a number of statistics on, on the official report today, Priding Officer, but I think those stats are, have been pretty well aired uh, here this afternoon. Needless to say, uh, unfortunately, not every pregnancy will be a positive experience in the emotional, the physical and the psychological stress of carrying your unborn child, as well as the financial costs of pregnancy, and raising that child can wreak havoc and, um, and emotional well-being of pregnant and postnatal women. There can be a significant impact in relation to that. The Centre for Maternal and Child uh, Inquiries has established that mental illness is one of the leading causes of maternal death in the UK. That is why such a campaign is crucial in raising awareness and worth prioritising. By encouraging and providing resources for early intervention, we can not only reduce rates of mental illness in mothers, but also save lives. Uh, I wanted to mention one of my local organisations, and it, it clearly does fantastic work across the country, because I want to talk about Homestart and the work they provide to support for women and families uh, and children under the age of five through practical and emotional support, volunteer visits, encouraging families to widen their support network and helping them to take advantage of resources and opportunities the community provides. It's a, it's a non-judgmental service. It's a non-statutory service, 
and it's about building relationships, and that's what sits at the heart of what Homestart Glasgow North do, which is the the, the, the branch of Homestart that I, I, I know the best. And I was uh, proud and privileged to, to speak at their AGM just uh, a few weeks ago. The work they do uh, to help mothers across the north of Glasgow, across Maryhill, Springburn, Royston, beyond is, it's quite frankly, exceptional. Uh, there are a variety of organisations doing equally fantastic work. Rosemont Childcare, I recently visited uh, a parent and toddlers group there, and some dads were there, which I'm, I'm pleased to say as well, in relation to um, the relationship building. And uh, also an uh, initiative in Postle Park, called Positive Postle Park, where Bernardo's and Stepping Stones for the Futures and other agencies get together to prioritise uh, families in that area. There was a couple of things I did want to put on the record, presiding officer, in, in the short time that I have left. I, I wouldn't forgive myself if I didn't talk about the mental health of those who lose their unborn child through miscarriage and the, the, the um, psychological and mental health impact that can have on families. I think we should put that on record during this debate as well. Also, the inequalities, not just economic, but the inequalities that befall certain women. If you've got a strong support network, it doesn't mean that you will have strong maternal mental health, but it gives you a fighting chance to do better than some that don't have that community resilience. And we should bear that in mind as well. I think the final thing that I would like to say is next year, befittingly, is the International Year of the Dad. I didn't actually know that until a few weeks ago when I attended Homestart, Glasgow North's AGM. And uh, surely uh, the men in this chamber, we've got quite a significant role to play ourselves in making sure that maternal mental health flourishes, because there is no rule book to be a mum, to be a dad. There are no rights and wrongs. We learn from our mistakes. We have that support network if we're lucky. And for some of us, our mental health will be impacted. That doesn't make you a bad parent. That makes you vulnerable and in need of support. And I think this afternoon's debate, and led by Mark MacDonald so, so ably, draws attention to that fact. And I'm delighted to share my experiences with the Chamber this afternoon, Presiding Officer. Thank you so much. Now I call on Jim Hume, after which we move to closing speech to the Minister. Uh, thanks very much, De Deputy Presiding Officer. I do, of course, congratulate Mark MacDonald for bringing this debate to the Chamber and the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland, of course, for their Healthy Start, Healthy Scotland campaign. And I think you should also congratulate in advance Bob Doris and his very much better half in their forthcoming uh, parenthood. <laughs> Presiding Officer, I have uh, raised the issue of lack of parity for mental and physical health in Scotland on a number of occasions during the Scottish Government debate back in January. I have pointed out the lack of parity in law. Ten months later, we still do not have uh, legislative provisions that place mental and physical health on an equal footing. Ten months later, I have not stop raising this issue and, uh, of course, take this chance again today. I think our discussion tonight on mental health of pregnant and postnatal women points to the increasing importance of uh, the guarantee to good mental health for all. So the Healthy Start, Healthy Scotland campaign makes provision for the earliest possible preventative measures for mothers and their infants. From the report, I quote, the early time after childbirth is a period of greater risk for severe mental illness in than in any other time in a woman's life. This can translate into, unfortunately, damaged brain development of the infant, whose relationship with its mother, of course, is absolutely vital at this early stage. With one in five women developing mental illness during pregnancy or in the first postnatal year, and one in four people in the overall population developing a mental Ill health illness at some point in their life, it's clear that we need to address this problem head on untreated, uh, we, you can have the most uh, ultimate of tragic consequences, as myself, and of course, many here, like Mary Scanlon, also know cases of. But the good news is that effective treatments are available, so I would like to urge the Scottish Government to make these preventative measures, of course, available to all. I noted that the UK Government, back in its 2015 budget, announced £75 million over five years for perinatal mental health and loved of course, like to see this replicated in Scotland. In a Freedom of Information request I submitted to the health boards, the responses should arise in need for psychological support for new mothers. One board saw its cases nearly triple, and quoting the board, they said the apparent rise in cases reflects the creation of the specialist perinatal midwife position in that year, which increased mental health 
awareness in the service, which we welcome, of course. So that's a successful example of awareness and trust of the services for new mothers, which could, of course, be followed elsewhere. Deputy Presiding Officer, this report marks a necessary station that, when adopted, will have a positive twofold effect, in my belief. The first is good mental health for all from the early start in life, and secondly, a gradual reduction in health inequalities that are compounded by poor mental health. Mental health is a, not the starting and ending point in reducing inequalities. It's, however, a major component that disproportionately affects people in the most deprived areas. They're five times more likely to have below average mental health than those in the least deprived areas. Yet through deprivation, people will want to lead normal lives, work and have families, of course. And we need to ensure that every member in the family is able to have access to the right therapies at the right time. Mark Macdonald's uh, motion correctly identifies the importance of working holistically with practitioners across medical specialisations, breaking down the singular concern of mental health health for mothers and infants, of course, should be the guiding principle of these actions. The Healthy Start, Healthy Scotland campaign is making the, uh, the call for the right time to be early on for the infants and their mothers. So, of course, I want to end by renewing my call for parity in law between mental and physical health. It's the next step that Scotland must take if we are to meaningfully provide mental health treatments for mothers and their babies. Thanks very much. I now call on Minister Jamie Hepburn to close this debate on behalf of the Government. Seven minutes or thereby, Thank please, you Minister. Thank you very much, uh, President. Can I uh, join with others in, in thanking uh, Mark McDonald for bringing forward this uh, subject uh, for debate? Can I echo uh, Jenny Mara's uh, comments about his uh, bringing his uh, family's personal experience to, to the debate, adding uh, to the debate? Can I also similarly say to uh, Mary Scanlon, who uh, spoke of the experience of her friend, that was obviously very difficult for her to do understandably, but I want to thank her for, for doing so. Uh, can I also uh, join with others? Uh, now that uh, Bob Doris has uh, gone public, uh, uh, can I make public my own previously privately expressed uh, congratulations to uh, both uh, Bob and uh, undoubtedly his much better uh, half, uh, Jarrett, as they uh, prepare for uh, parenthood. Can I also welcome the uh, Royal College of Psychiatrists Healthy Start Healthy Scotland campaign and express my uh, support for the campaign's aims. Uh, this uh, Members' business debate continues the attention our parliament has had on uh, mental health. I'm uh, proud that we uh, have had that uh, focus. Uh, mental illness, including uh, perinatal mental illness, is one of the top public health challenges in Europe, with uh, an estimated third of the population being affected by mental health disorders every year. It's rightly a topic that occupies us, uh, President Officer. We need to be as comfortable talking about mental ill health as we do talking about physical ill health. And I think having a, a focus uh, on a debate and discussion in this parliament is an important part of that. A process. We, uh, in the government, we uh, agree that good perinatal uh, mental health is a, a vitally important issue. Uh, Dave Taunt spoke about how uh, mental illness can uh, affect uh, new mothers, and of course, there is a, a common uh, idea that when uh, a woman gives birth, it's the happiest time of her life. We know that for many, though, there can be a very extremely uh, difficult uh, time. Mary Scanlon uh, mentioned that there have been a couple of written questions uh, lodged of late. She uh, she didn't expressly say that I had answered them. I presume I was the uh, minister who answered them. If uh, she has felt they have been uh, unhelpful uh, and dismissive, uh, that certainly is not my intention, never my intention with any uh, answer I would give to a, a question, certainly not in this uh, area. I think there's broad consensus. So let me uh, offer to Mary Scanlon and indeed any member if they have any uh, particular concerns they want to discuss with me any time they, they need only uh, ask. Uh, my overriding expectation, President Officer, is that Individuals should be uh, treated uh, accordingly uh, to uh, their uh, clinically assessed needs with care uh, and support uh, put in place which responds quickly and appropriately to those uh, needs. Uh, in uh, Scotland, we uh, ensure that uh, GPs, midwives, health visitors and obstetricians have perinatal mental health education as part of their undergraduate training. And NHS Education for Scotland will soon be uh, launching a national resource and online module in relation to perinatal mental health, which will have... Uh, open access for, for staff in any, any sector. This is, of course, in addition to uh, any local education uh, that will be offered. Our uh, national mental health strategy and clinical guidelines for health professional support in uh, mothers experiencing mental health problems and ensure the NHS uh, delivers safe and uh, effective care to those 
uh, who uh, need it. Uh, there is, of course, uh, an issue, and to Mr Macdonald clearly set out the nature of the challenge around those not being uh, identified. My expectation is that uh, NHS boards uh, should provide safe, effective care and services which support and respond to the needs of uh, the individual for women at high risk of uh, perinatal men mental illness. That includes developing a detailed uh, plan for their late pregnancy and early uh, postnatal psychiatric management. This plan should be agreed with the mother to be and shared with maternity services, the community uh, midwifery team, GP, health visitor uh, and mental health services so that we have that uh, cross-cutting uh, approach. A member spoke about the importance of the connection between uh, mothers and children. Uh, Mary Scanlon uh, touched on this uh, area. It is, of course, uh, under the a point of law uh, that uh, there is a duty in health boards to provide uh, such services and accommodation as necessary uh, to allow uh, women with uh, postnatal depression to be admitted to hospital accompanied by their child under one year old. We have extended uh, that right under the uh, 2015 uh, Act to uh, uh, mothers with any uh, mental uh, disorder. If there is any suggestion, as was uh, uh, suggested I think, by Mary Scanlon, that this is a duty not being complied with, uh, and I can be provided with that information, not necessarily in the, this debate, but if Mary Scanlon wants to, uh, I can assure you I will take that very seriously indeed, of course. Mary Scanlon. Sorry, I have given the paper to official report, but it was raised in the Royal College paper that, uh, although it was a right, there weren't always the facilities for mothers to take their children in. So it came from the Royal College paper. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to uh, reflect on that. And if uh, there's more we need to do in that regard, I'm, I'm happy to, to commit to, to looking at that matter. Uh, as our uh, population's general health has been steadily improving uh, in Scotland, we know that health inequalities have been uh, growing. This was a point picked up by uh, uh, Mark McDonald, Bob Dorris and Jim Hume. We know that uh, poor mental health is more common in some uh, segments of the population uh, and others in uh, socially economically deprived groups, uh, in particular social inequalities in mental health are enduring and persistent. The causes of poorer mental health are, uh, of course, varied, but we know that there is a, a, a statistical correlation uh, along the lines of uh, socioeconomic uh, circumstance. Uh, we have to address the underlying social determinants of health and uh, see that they have a, 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 an impact on in mental health. Uh, we have to take action to support meaningful, uh, secure employment, good quality housing in neighbourhoods and high quality education and childcare. Uh, of course, we uh, need to, uh, to do more than that. We need to uh, have... Uh, uh, indeed, yes. Mr MacDonald. I'm grateful to the point the Minister raises, and uh, he will also be aware from the, the, the speech I made that uh, isolation uh, is both a, a factor in the development of maternal, poor maternal mental health, but also uh, a compounding factor following that, that, that happening. Um, in terms of the SAMH social prescribing, which I spoke of, which can often uh, help to tackle some of that isolation by directing individuals towards social opportunities, does the Minister support that? And is he looking at ways that that can perhaps be taken forward? Well, I, I was hoping to touch yeah, that later, but let me take that up uh, now, because I see I'm, I'm running out of time. I, I very much uh, support the whole concept of social prescribing. I think uh, earlier I spoke of the the need for a partnership approach between health professionals, but the partnership approach we need to see in, in ensuring a, a more positive sense of mental well-being uh, right across uh, Scotland it requires uh, a partnership approach, not just between uh, the National Health Service and also other uh, elements of social care, but very much involving, uh, I think, the third and independent sector who uh, are very innovative and be able to uh, create uh, very uh, positive examples of, of community support. We have uh, announced that we are an additional £100 million uh, for uh, mental health services over the next five years. An element of that is for primary care. That is not necessarily uh, Little time in, hand in if you need uh, it. general uh, practice per se, although some of it will be. I have been very clear that some of that has to be directed to uh, those very organisations I have mentioned that I think uh, can uh, uh, play a, a positive role. And I think social prescribing uh, will be a, a, a part of that. And indeed, uh, both uh, uh, Mr Macdonald and Bob Doris spoke uh, of the positive example of home start initiatives in their uh, respective areas. I'm always very keen to hear about that in this uh, type of debate, President Officer, and, and try and spread uh, good uh, uh, practice. Uh, President Officer, let me uh, conclude, because I, I seem a, a quite a bit over time. Uh, now, my commitment is that we uh, have to uh, move to being a society with reduced stigmatisation around issues of mental health and uh, one with a, a stronger sense of uh, mental well-being uh, collectively. Uh, we know uh, that getting it right 
early uh, matters in that regard, and that uh, that has to mean support for good uh, perinatal mental health. Mr Macdonald uh, and other members, and indeed the wider public, can be assured of my commitment uh, to working to that end. Thank you very much. And thank you, and thank you all for taking part in this important debate. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.